Tuesday, April 14th, 2005 at 6.30 p.m. Now we take roll call. Commissioner Mario Colombia? Here. Jason Battern? Here. Peter Menard? Here. Dennis Cashin? Here. Leonard Scheid? Here. Mark, Martin Sharp? Here. Jerry Wilson? Here. Bill Zednick? Here. Barbara Zednick? Here. Okay, committee member Hinman and alternate member uh, Pankrazi is not available or not able to make the meeting tonight. Can I have a motion and a second to excuse committee member Hinman and alternate Pankrazi? I so move. I have a motion from committee member Sharp. Second. And a second from committee member Wilson. Any discussions? All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. Motion passes. <clears throat> the first item on the agenda is to approve the draft minutes from the regular Water Planning Committee meeting held on March 10th, 2015. Can I have a motion and a second to approve the draft minutes? I so move. I have a motion from committee member Passion. Second. And a second from committee member Schneed. Scheid, sorry. Item is open for committee discussions. Any comments? Okay, all those in favor say aye. 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 <laughs> all those opposed say nay. Motion carries. Okay. Now it's time for citizens who would like to address the Water Planning Committee. Are there any speaker cards? Does anyone in the audience wish to speak? Quiet group. We have no old business on the agenda for this meeting. So moving on to new business, I'll turn it over to the facilitator, Teresa Manikin. See if that works better when we're trying to manage the pool system for the session. And we will move on through the not on. Nothing. Can you hear me? Oh. There? Thank you. Sorry about that. All right. I think it's going in and out. Can you hear me now? Yeah. yeah a little bit. That was okay. Good. All right. Sorry about that. All right. Welcome to the Water Planning Committee meeting. We're going to go ahead and move through the PowerPoint. And thank you. All right. Here, we want to review the timeline. We're trying to do this every time so that we kind of orient us to where we've been and where we're going. You can follow along in your uh, slides that you've all been handed out as well. Remember October through January, we talked about a lot of uh, information. We went to the tours of facilities. We had tr uh, staff presentations on water, gave you a background and all that. And now we're in this next little leg, this next step of things for the February through May. We talked about some fundamentals of utility finance and rate making. Um, we had the consultant here to talk to you about that. Uh, last meeting was kind of the first session on the integrated water master plan. And we have the rest of that here tonight for you. And then later on uh, next month, we're going to talk about the rate design al alternative, excuse me, and then start in May and June formulating some recommendations and then uh, move to the council work session, the community meeting, and um, final things out hopefully by the end into September. Here's the calendar dates. I want to remind you of these. In May, we, May 12th was our one date. We've added a meeting May 19th because we think that there might be a lot of discussion. It'll be really getting down to the nuts and bolts of the um, rates and rate recommendations. So we want to make sure there's ample time for the discussion on that. We're hoping you can all make it. You have time in your calendar for that. Add it on that meeting. And then in June will be the council work session. We want to um, go to the council first. And then after that, it will be the community meeting. We're hoping that you can all attend both those because they're pretty important. One, to go to the council work session to be able to let them know that you were involved in this process. And then also for the community meeting so that when you have your neighbors and friends there, you can explain to them kind of the discussions you had and the things you listened to and, and uh, why some of the recommendations were um, the way they are. 
and then um, July have the 60 day notice posted. Uh, the council will adopt it hopefully in um, August, end of August. And then uh, one of the reasons we wanted to get to June also, the June work session I wanted to mention is because they go on break. So we wanted to try and get to that work session. That's kind of the goal. Any questions about the calendar? All right. So uh, next we're going to talk about meeting guidelines and discussion. You have in your packet, and I think I have it as a slide as well. Okay. No? Excuse me. I want to pick mine up. Hold on, because I want to have it in my hands. I apologize. So you have in your packet uh, meeting guidelines. You know, it was thought that maybe in order to have um, everybody have an opportunity to speak, we thought that there might be some people that didn't feel they have an opportunity to speak or or um, weren't sure, should I raise my hand, should I do this? So we thought maybe it'd be a good time for us to kind of um, work together and figure out if we maybe need some guidelines. Thank you. Maybe need some guidelines. So the ones that are in your packet are the meeting guidelines from the general plan committee that got together. So I don't know if you had a moment to, to kind of look those over and see what you think about that, see if you think it's a good idea, see if we need to add any guidelines, if we need to take them out where you just say, no, that's crazy talk, I'm not going to do that. If you could, what, what do you think about that? And I can start around the room or I can figure out, I guess one of them, and uh, Marge, uh, excuse me, committee member Sharp had brought it up earlier, was she said sometimes it's confusing because she, you know, kind of feels kind of weird raising your hand. So it's kind of like, what do I do? Or should we use our name tag? Um, another method too is you can hold your pen up. You know, whenever you want to speak, you can kind of hold your pen like this. Something that kind of grabs my attention. So I don't know if that's a good idea. Well, my thought is I think the chairman's done a really good job of running the meetings. Um, professionally, I've been running federal advisory committees for 40 years, and he's done a good job. And I don't see any reason why to have the chairman just continue to run the meetings the way he's done so. Okay. Any other thoughts? I agree. You, you agree? Okay. Other thoughts? I'll, st I'll start on this end if you don't mind, committee member Scheid. Thoughts on any of the guidelines or what you've heard from your fellow committee members? No, I think the way we're doing is fine. I, I think when, if I have something to speak, I generally can get the chairman's attention or I can get somebody to speak to me and we can stop it. But I do like when we do the discussions that we get through a portion, then maybe we break to discuss and we write our questions down. That way we're not constantly interrupting the, the person that's going to get them off track and that way we can get out in time. Oh, like we did it last time where we kind of had a, a predetermined breaks that worked much better for you? I've seen that works pretty good. I think we're able to kind of move through the material because there is a lot of material. All right. Committee Member Sharp? Well, <clears throat> I like the signal um, that we want to speak aside from raising our hands. I feel like I'm a kid back in school <laughs> when I have to raise my hand. So I like the idea of a pen could be misconstrued as, you know, you're thinking, you're writing. But I, I think if we do something with the name tags, I think it's, um, you know, whether it's just a or turning it upside down, or I think it's, I feel more grown up. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, does anyone have a problem doing something similar, just trying to, that way you get my attention, or however you'd like to, if you feel comfortable just raising your hand or yelling? <clears throat> hey, Teresa. <laughs> I'm, I'm not embarrassed by raising my hand or standing up or, or whatever. Whatever other people feel comfortable on. Um, I, I agree that if I have something to say, I'm going to say it. Mm -hmm. and, and typically, we all have that opportunity. Um, Mario has done a good job of uh, making sure that uh, we're not called on. But, you know, if, if Marge doesn't feel it, or she doesn't feel it's our place, I, I, don't, want, I don't want that. <laughs> So we'll, and I'll do a better, I'll tell you what, and then I will commit to, to doing a better job of making sure I'm watching. So if you even give me signals like that, I will, I will take note. Thoughts, committee member Passion, on the guidelines? Um, no, I, I think we're doing fine. I, I think the guidelines are all, you know, pretty self-explanatory here. Um, I'm, I'm happy with the way things are running right now. Anything further? Yeah. Vice Chairman Battern? I'll do my part to try to keep an eye out, too, in case. And if there is something that maybe he's talking about something else, I could tap him, let you guys know. Just an option, Marge, for something that, that might work um, is if we had some kind of chat or something that you could just put forward 
you know, a red dot, something, you know, something that, that you just have and you go, okay, I got something to say. And then that way it's clearly visible. You have a chance to see it, let the presenter finish their presentation, then go, okay. Okay. Just something that's, that's visual. So she doesn't have to raise her hand if, you know, because sure. that sometimes I agree with, I agree with that. It's kind of weird. Like, can I please go to the bathroom? <laughs> okay. If we had something that, you know, we could just sit in front of or to the side right here, something that grabs attention, you know, a little granola bar. Yeah, granola, granola bar, street marker or something. I'm sure the city can can come up with some good ideas. Okay. So it and might Chairman, be an option. Okay. And Chairman, I'm going to wait to, for you at the end since you're the chair, if, if, you, if I may. That's okay. Committee Member Wilson, any, any thoughts on the, what you've heard or the guidelines? I was just thinking during the general plan, we just did this. Oh, okay. Oh, that's what it means when it means turn it, turn it sideways. All right. Sure. I'll watch for that as well. That was a large much larger committee than what we have here, but it didn't always work either. Okay. <laughs> and committee member said it. Well, I'm pretty satisfied with the way things got handled by the chairman. There's a question on number 16, avoid editorial. What does that mean? Avoid editorial. So has somebody been editorializing? Uh, I don't... I don't believe it was a, a commentary on any of the, the activities that have taken place in this meeting. It was just something they developed. I think what that means, though, what that goes to is um, just to be maybe uh, concise in your comments and make sure they're um, related to the, the, the work of the committee. And sometimes, you know, if, if we get the idea, I would say if we get the idea, then we'll let you know. And if I try to help you get closure on that, don't, don't be offended just in case I see other people wanting to, to speak. I, I guess that's where they were going with the avoid editorials. Yes. Oh, this is from the general. Okay. Right. Yeah, these are from the other committee. These were the, it was just a, a idea, a thought, or maybe this, if it would fit with this committee. Chairman. First, I'd like to say that I believe all the committee members are doing a great job of asking questions to the presenters, uh, whether it's raising our hand or trying to get their attention to speak. Um, Going down that path, I like what um, Committee Member Sharp said, uh, where she can do this. Some of us are doing this. I have no problem with you raising it or turning it, get our attention. Um, one of the three of us will catch it, and we'll get you in that talk, in that conversation. So I, I like that idea. Uh, otherwise not, that's all I have for input. So did we want to make it? I, mean, I uh, just want to make sure that I'm... Uh, picking up what you're saying. So do we not want to take a vote and pass this, or is everyone comfortable? Just I, leave it like it is. I don't, I want, don't to want to take a and, vote on that. You do not want to take a vote? No. Okay. I think that's what I'm hearing from the team. Okay. But we'll pay attention, mm -hmm. again, to mm -hmm. the request, which Marge was saying. She's correct. I mean, just to get their attentions. <clears throat> Raise it, turn it, we'll see you. And then I'm, I'm going to ask, though, just, just so that I can be a better manager of your time and your discussion, if you, um, I, I'm going to try and do better at making sure you all get an opportunity to speak, because I don't want anyone leaving feeling they couldn't speak or feeling like their opinions weren't heard. So I'll, I'll do a better job of that as well. Or try to, if, so if you think I'm missing something, don't mind calling me out, all right? One more thing I just wanted to throw out. When you see the clock and we're getting close to 830, don't worry, let's continue. Let's get that synergy going, or continuing. Uh, we don't need to stop right at that time. So if you feel your questions were not, you could not ask your questions, you certainly can. Don't look, don't, just because it says 8.30, we can continue. So I want to throw that out there as well. And don't feel like we have to um, convince each other of our own opinions. The reason that you were all brought together is you all have diverse opinions. So it informs your recommendations much better. It becomes a much more, um, a better, plan or recommendation than it would be if everybody thought the exact same way. So if you have an opinion, don't necessarily feel like everyone has to share your opinion and you need to make sure that you convince them of that before we end here. All right? Okay. I will move on. Let's see. Um, oh, no. So the once again, the ultimate goal, though, is the recommendations report to council. In that vein, Anna graciously put together kind of a starting place. I don't know if you want to say something about that, Anna. Is this, that's this document here. You all have this document? Yep. Okay. Um, so I just put in your packets. Um, I thought it would be helpful to just have something tangible as we go forward. 
um, something you can look at and say, oh, this is something like what we will um, have as a final report. So it's just something for you to look at. Really, what I did was just kind of try to put together, I, I tried to look at, you know, other citizen committee reports, things like that, and just put some, you know, background information in there to show you we'll have, you know, the current rates, we'll give a little background, we'll talk about the committee, and then we'll have your rate recommendations in there. We'll also have in there your other recommendations, like with your conservation initiatives um, that we'll discuss, that you have been discussing and will discuss. Um, and right now, I just threw everything in there that we've talked about that I've heard you say at the last couple of meetings. So that doesn't mean any, all of this has to go through, none of it has to go through. I, I just want to make sure I got all of your comments in there. So this is just kind of a working document moving forward. Um, we'll keep revising it as we go through. Um, but I just wanted to kind of give you a, something tangible to look at again. Any questions for Anna? Yeah. Uh, yes. As we think of something that might be a chapter that should be added into this, we just email it to you. Sure. General outline. Would that be just That'd be fine. Yeah. Obviously, I'm not going to. I look at this and uh, three days later, is that the No, <laughs> exactly. No. And what we'll do as a staff is we'll, we'll work on it and take your recommendations, put them in here. Um, and then we will, um, you know, work on it with the chair and vice chair. Um, so that'll be something we'll deliver to council at the end. But, you know, the committee will all see it. We'll all discuss it and all that. So. Any other questions for Anna? Yeah, so I have a request. Can I have this in a Word document? Can I have it in a Word document? Uh, could I have it? Okay. Could it be sent to me? Sure. Thanks. Just know that this is just me. I know. Typing up. Okay. I know. <laughs> okay. I know. Okay, sure. I can send it out to the committee if you'd like. I would personally. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. So in a moment, um, we're going to first have uh, Deputy City Manager Bob Beckley say a few words, and then he's going to uh, lead into the presentation for tonight, which is Carollo Engineers once again um, giving kind of the second phase of discussion on the integrated water master plan. So this is more focused on the capital um, project side of it. So if you wouldn't mind, they do have some uh, predetermined spaces once again where they have some breaks for questions and whatnot. But if you wouldn't mind jotting down your questions and that way when they get to that point, um, you can ask those. And um, we're going to do round robin, kind of just I'll start on one end and move around. That way everybody, I'll make sure everybody has an opportunity. And uh, we have some time at the end, of course, for committee discussion because we want to make sure there's plenty of time for that. So now I'll give you Bob Beckley. looking forward to tonight. I hope that you are also. It's a pretty important night uh, as we're going through. Yeah. Every, every uh, meeting has been critical, but this one is probably more important because I think you're, you're getting into the meat of the recommendation. Uh, our staff has spent a lot of time with a consultant, as you've heard, uh, Carrillo has done a great job in terms of putting together uh, an action plan. And as they go through it, it's intentionally set up so that they can get through the majority, if not all of it, tonight. There'll be time for questions, as we said, breaks. Uh, but what we wanted to do is, if I could have the next slide. I'm sorry. I'm used to council meetings. We have someone in the back room that automatically advances the slides. <clears throat> we try to come up with a graphic try to bring home as far as what, how, how, how you're interacting with staff, how the consultant's interacting, the role of the council, the role of the, the public and the customers. We, we came up with this. Three core issues. The infrastructure, you know, what, what we're going to need to build and what we need to maintain. Secondly, sustainability as far as now we have a system that we want to be dependable, that will be long-lasting, that will be able to be uh, maintained over the long, long, long term. And also the costs. Um, you probably, the members of this committee may, may have special interest in either in multiple uh, of these areas. Uh, the, you're all customers, so cost is a, is a significant concern of yours. That we need to have, uh, that, that, that part of the, the equation has to be weighed in on, and that's what we, we need to hear. How do these, these improvements, and eventually next month, we're going to talk about the actual rates, so you'll see what the impact of all of these costs are. 
But other things such as sustainability and dependability as far as how robust the system needs to be, uh, the levels of investment that you'll see in this report uh, will be graduated so that you'll see three different levels of investment uh, that will be broken out in the, the report. And also the infrastructure. Uh, some of you are probably more familiar than others as far as what the infrastructure means, as far as the condition, the upkeep, and, and the quality of the, what we have to, to deliver our services. What, uh, if you could uh, try the next one. Uh, then lastly, my portion of the presentation is really to think about the three questions uh, that we've identified here. Your comments on the, the various uh, critical needs as the presentation goes through, you'll see what the consultant is going to be highlighting as far as what the critical needs of our system are and what their, their steps that they're recommending we take to address those. Uh, from everything that's been presented tonight and in previous sessions, have we overlooked anything? Is there things that you know, you've thought of or you've raised questions about uh, in the course of this, this process and that you don't feel were answered adequately? And then finally, uh, the recommended improvements as we, we talked about, do they match up to the needs? There'll be costs, the total cost of that, those, these improvements will be uh, given to you tonight, so you'll have an idea of the magnitude of it. And then finally, uh, your comments that, that we hear tonight will definitely impact our final presentation of the recommendation. What you see tonight is the consultant's recommendations. We, our staff has, has really provided all the information to them in their site interviews, their inspections. They've gone through it back and anal analyzed the, the system and come back have come back with this report. Um, we're very uh, comfortable with this recommendation. We think they've done a great job. We really look forward to your, your comments and your observations. Uh, with that, I'd like to present uh, the consultant, Guy Carpenter and Richard Humphreys. I think we'll be presenting tonight. You, and with that, I'll turn over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Is this a speaker here or a microphone? Hello again. Uh, for those who don't remember, I'm Guy Carpenter with Corolo, uh, Richard Humphreys, and Eric McCleskey. Uh, we're the core group of people that are working on this project for you. Uh, before we get into the cost, just a brief review of, um, of what we talked to you about last time, just to kind of get everybody back on the same page. Our purpose of tonight is to present the five-year water and wastewater CIP uh, capital improvement program project costs. And I did want to go over a review from last time. Remember that we talked to you about levels of service and what your customers expect. And there's sort of a low to high range uh, relative to various uh, categories, such as supply interruptions, minimum pressure assurance, fire flow, and as well uh, as water quality. Uh, the highest level is you're never having any supply interruptions, um, your pressures are guaranteed at all times, and fire flow is available at all times under any condition. A um, little bit less than that, you're dealing with a little bit of interruption in service. Um, of course, it just goes down from there. So again, just a reminder of what we said before, um, you know, third world countries are usually down in the, the five range. Typically, the municipalities in this area are in the one to two range. And under all circumstances, we have to maintain water quality. We have to meet the Safe Drinking Water Act requirements for drinking water quality. So level of service includes two things. One is we're sort of balancing the amount of money that you invest in your infrastructure to mitigate whatever risks might be there. So that's one thing that we consider. The other thing is what the customers actually expect from their utility. And the problem is that if you fail to deliver water, um, you know, if you have intermittent service or if there's major failures, that's a very visible thing on the city. Um, you lose public trust, not just in the water utility, but because it's attributed to the city, it sort of is widespread. This is one of the most, one of the most um, 
visible things uh, that affects the community is when they don't have water ser service or if there's a blowout of an intersection because of a water main break, that kind of thing. That gets the attention of the customers. And it's noteworthy to say that um, you know, emergency repairs typically cost a lot more than be doing preventive maintenance. So again, that example of a blown out intersection, uh, not only does it cause a, a lot of damage, but it's also a disruption to commerce in the city and that type of thing. And then if in unresolved, these can be a threat to public health. Also, when it does come time to make an investment in your infrastructure, if you've lost the public trust, it's a lot harder that, for them to say yes to when it's time to go out and get a bond authorization or increase rates and that sort of thing. So uh, you've got to keep that in mind. And then um, the, another consequence of failure is that growth and development might be constrained by that. So we talked to you about the various performance criteria that go into um, developing a, a robust water system. And again, we've shown, sort of shown this puzzle to remind you of those components. And each one of those is supported by minimum standards that are in st state statute, as well as good engineering practice. So we talked to you about some of these last time, actually went into quite a bit of detail about each one of these, so I won't go through them by detail again, but just re recall that they're there. Uh, related to production capacity, pumping capacity, storage, uh, fire flow, all of that, um, we have these, these uh, standards in addition to, again, the Safe Drinking Water Act standards for the maximum contaminant levels of all pollutants. One of the other things that we showed you last time, we kind of, we're doing two parts to this project, this initial project. One is evaluating your system according to these performance criteria, but also doing an assessment of the existing uh, infrastructure in terms of its condition. And we showed you this graphic before this table that just showed from, a, from an age standpoint with the wells that you've got, um, some of them are old enough that they probably are not worth rehabilitating and need to be replaced. Some of them do need to be rehabilitated. Uh, and really the point of this is just to remind you that your biggest threat right now is water production, meaning from your wells. Um, and that you'll see on the, on the subsequent tables, the biggest investment is in the water production side of things. Um, in addition to the condition of the existing facilities, I added a little box at the bottom there. Uh, you also need three additional wells just for water uh, supply reliability. So in addition to what you've already got, that needs to be replaced and rehabilitated, uh, really within the next five year window, you need to have three additional wells just to make sure that you can keep up with demand. In some parts of the city service area, it's about demand. In other parts of the city service area, it's about having enough uh, water supply for a fl fire flow condition. And we'll get into that a little bit more. So really what this is saying is, we think you need somewhere between five and six new wells, and then for three of the other wells, they need to be rehabilitated. So at that point, just as a reminder from last time, any questions about the performance criteria as well as the condition assessment work that we've done? We have one question. Uh, you just, the little bullet you just talked about, adding the additional three wells for reliability, what do you consider gallons per minute to be about the average size well that you're looking for so you can maintain three instead of six? Or three? We're going to be looking at about 1,400 to 1,600 gallons uh, gallons per minute, and that's about 2 million gallons a day. For each well? For each well. Okay. And that would be the three replacement wells plus the three new wells? Correct. Each one of them is in that range. That's what the typical capacity is in this, in this area. Uh, that seems kind of uh, like a surprise. Why? Well, again, um, Relative to those performance criteria, the vulnerabilities that you have associated with fire flow and a peak day demand, if one, in particular, your biggest vulnerability is you've got two wells feeding one treatment system and production facility. And if one of those goes out, effectively they both go out because there's a blending requirement. Mm -hmm. So in order to backfill that, you really do need to have basically two additional wells to backfill that, uh, that, that situation. But, it, but again, this seems like uh, one of these uh, surprise type uh, moves. I guess I, I don't understand why we hadn't recognized this earlier and uh, was a little bit more prepared, you know, to, to address this as opposed to saying, well, we need six more wells. Uh, you know, perhaps uh, if we were to have looked at this 
earlier or understood it better? Or yeah, let me give you an analogy. Uh, basically, the last time you did a master plan update was about eight years ago. So this is kind of like coming to your primary care physician after not seeing him or her after eight years and sort of getting a health assessment of your, of your system. And um, so at this point, we're sort of giving you the information about your health after that long of time going by. There's been a lot going on in the city. There's been a lot of turnover of staff. There's been a lot of changes in rates of development and priorities. And so this is just that point in, in time at which we're doing an assessment to kind of give you a finger on the pulse of where you're at. So it is unfortunate that it took that long to get here, but we're here today and we've got kind of a treatment plan, if you will, for what you need to do. Was there a, a plan to take a couple aspirins and uh, see me in the morning? Well, you know, I, um, gradually work into this you'll see we've we've sort of grouped the improvements that need to be done in i'll say biteable chunks that will allow the city time and the resources with the resources that you have the ability to deploy these over time um, unfortunately based on the performance criteria and the condition assessment that we don't think any of these could really be cut it's just a matter of how you t phase them in um, so ultimately, you'll have to help the city make those decisions, and we can talk to you about why each one of these is, is necessary if you want to do that. Um, but again, they do re reference back to the performance criteria and the, and the actual condition of the asset. I think I asked the same question at the last meeting. On those three old uh, wells, mm -hmm. um, we were talking about, you said eight years ago? Something going along the lines of what uh, committee member Zenick was talking about. Um, eight years ago, if I went to the doctor and I had an issue, there would have been some preventative maintenance or medication, something along those lines. Eight years ago, we knew that it was going to come up to replace. As you mentioned, last month, 50 years. So we already knew eight years ago, 50 years was coming. So we had a choice. We had either preventative or surgery. It looks like neither happened. Well, obviously, nothing happened. Just kind of curious, uh, coming from your standpoint, why? And that goes back to his question again, why? Well, uh, we weren't the consultant that did it last time, and, and our job wasn't to assess whether or not there's operational or management efficiencies within the city of Goodyear. Again, I do reference the fact that there's been a lot of staff changes. And there's been a lot of changes in the rate of development and where development actually started and stopped over right. time. I think you mentioned the first why is you were not the uh, group that did this Correct. eight years ago. Correct. So there's the first why right there. And I think the scope of the last master plan was quite a bit different as well. Oh. So, okay. and, and I don't know if anybody from staff wants to address mm -hmm. that, but. Well, this is just a follow-up kind of assessment of, of what, what exists. Uh, right. right. It's a good point. You made a good point that he was not part of the team before. Uh, right. Wilson? Yeah, um, and the three wells that are here that need re, uh, rehabilitation, if I understood what was said last month correctly, when they're rehabilitated, they usually reduce capacity? And um, I'm looking at how low it, the capacity is right well, now. Well, what usually happens is you get an initial, um, we should be able to get an initial better rate of flow out of it. It'll diminish back over time. So first it'll come back to okay. a better rate. At least that's what we're hoping. That's what typically happens. Because I just noticed they're not the highest capacity. I mean, what you said was the goal of each new well. Right. All three combined just barely makes one. And it does depend well. on where these are across the service yeah. area because, you know, obviously the closer you get to kind of old river bottoms and that kind of thing, the gravel is, is, is better and you get more transmissive, transmissivity to the, to okay. the well. So it just depends on where you are in the city, but we think for the new wells, you should be able to get in that 12 to 16, 14 to 1600 range. Okay. The rehab, it depends on how bad the, the casings are. If they're in really bad shape, we may not be able to get more. And you'll see later on in, as we go through some of these recommendations, um, we're not quite at six wells. We're actually at about five wells when, when we look at the actual recommendations because there's a point in time where we want to stop and say, okay, what have we got? Did we rehab these wells to a point where they're actually producing more than they were before? And if they are, maybe we're good at this point. Um, so, so you'll see that in the recommendations there. It's, there's five, basically five instead of six. 
Um, I know that this, you made a comment at the last meeting and, and you uh, cited manholes and then you said, well, that's a different story. And I assume that you've left the condition of manholes out because the, the wells themselves are really important. But just for an overall picture of our whole system, I think that we need to know what kind of shape our infrastructure is, which includes manholes. Yep, I'll show you that. Oh, okay. This is just a stopping point. And, and all I, I didn't want to go through everything that we did last time. I just wanted to remind you kind of the context of what we had, and then we'll get into the actual details. And I've got even a picture of a manhole to show you what they look like. Okay, these wells, um, they just service the south of I-10? Uh, no, I'll show you a map where all of these are. They're all over the city. So they service the north of I-10? Well, they don't serve Liberty or the They don't serve Liberty. Oh, are they all south? They're all south. Okay. They're all south. There's some <coughs> Adam is located north, but they don't serve north. But so it's all connected through the distribution network. Okay. Okay. Except for the, the very specific service areas of the mm -hmm. other utilities. But these wells are all connected into your distribution system, and they, they work together to serve the water needs of the entire system. Of the entire Goodyear City, the city of Goodyear. They serve the entire service area that the city of Goodyear delivers water to. They do not serve the areas that Liberty Water would serve, nor the areas that Epcor Water Company would serve. Let me get to, can I just go to the map real yeah. quick? So do you want to point that out on here? Okay, these are your Adam and Wales to the north. This pipe goes down through the Liberty utility service area to get down to here. Site 21 is just south of I-10. So all the pipe areas from here on south where there's development of any sort is where we're talking about water service being provided. And then on the needs re rehabilitation on these three, <coughs> what levels of rehabilitation? One of my questions were, are there different kind of costs associated with rehabilitation? So I think one of the answers were 50000 to a million dollars. So, you know, if you have something with 325 flow rate, is it better just to replace it or rehabilitate it if you're talking about a million dollars? I mean, I don't know. The, the problem is um, kind of twofold. One is that it may not be, there, there's rules associated with redrilling a well. And, and you can only do it within 660 feet. That's just a rule that the Department of Water Resources has. But, but even in doing that, we really need to understand what the impacts are to the aquifer. There needs to be a study to look at that as an interim step. So it's, it's better that you've already got the infrastructure in place. And if we think that it's rehabable, which means basically taking a hydrogeologist and going down hole with a camera to look at it, make sure that it's still re re rehabilitatable, then we would go ahead and do it because it's already in place, it's already there. It's just faster to do that. And, and we're concerned about some of the vulnerabilities you have right now. So to drill a new well would take a lot longer than to rehab a well. Yeah, I, and you may have mentioned this at the last meeting, but you talked about 20 and 22 being connected. Um, so if, if one goes down, they both go down. That's a big hit. Um, why are they connected? What, what makes them have, you know, what's the engineering or logic behind connecting these because two? They're, because they're good producing wells, but they have water quality concerns associated with them. And it was less expensive overall to treat and blend than to have individual treatment systems uh, on each wellhead and then be able to push that water out. So that decision was made a while ago. It's very difficult to decouple that now. It would be more expensive to decouple it. So where you say additional wells to supply, you got three. So we're talking three that are bad, need replacing, three that need rehab, and the two. If those two go bad, we have the other three that are bad. I mean, we potentially, again, I think Well, those a, wells are in good condition. Those being 20 and 22? Right. They're in good condition. So, so no worry? Not to worry about those. But there was an issue a while back 
correct, with regards to those two wells? Well, and again, that had to do with a, a, a part being out. And so you're vulnerable when a part goes sure. out. The so, wells themselves are in good, in good shape. And you brought up a good point. We're vulnerable. So, okay, vulnerable. now we've got three wells that need to be reworked on. Are we going to do one very, at a time? You have very little redundancy in your system. And, and so your operators are awake every night waiting for the call when they don't have enough water production capacity if there's a fire. There, that's the kind of concern that the operations staff has right now, and, and I understand that having been an operator of a system myself. So, and, and, and so they, they really don't have anywhere else to go if wells go down. There's no place else to get water. So that's the big concern that we have right now. So when we replace, sorry, when we replace the wells, are we doing one at a time? Um, we'll show you um, later on in, in sort of this groupings of projects that we're, we're recommending. You would do several of them at the same time, or a few of them at the same time. You get a cost savings by doing that if you sure. bring them, you know, have a contractor come in and do them at the same time. So and there's then, a deployment process of the project that we're trying to make it cost effective for you. Maybe I'm jumping ahead, but then how long does it take to replace a well? Well, to drill a new well, um, again, we... In some cases, the, a study has to be done first. We've got to do a well siting study to look at where they can actually be done. In other cases where we know it can be redrilled within the 660 feet, it may be just a matter of you know, 12 to 18 months. But because there's design, there's a design phase, and then you've got to contract and get it done. If there's a treatment technology that needs to be applied to it, that has to be factored in, and that takes a little bit longer as well. Not to mention the fact that there's a lot of competition right now for well drilling because California's having a drought and, um, and, and basically CAP shortage is coming and everybody's drilling more wells to get ready for it. The study was how long? Um, what do you think, Mark, a, a well siting study? Two to three months. Yeah, maybe three months. Yes, thanks, sorry. Um, you, you asked part of my question, how long does it take to uh, uh, drill a new well, but also how long does it take to, to re rehabilitate a well? It's one of those things where you don't know what you don't know until you get in there and start looking at it. We may get in there with a, with a closed caption camera and find out that it's in really bad shape and, and something that we're recommending as actual re rehabilitation is going to require a replacement. So we don't know until we get in there to know exactly what's going to need to be done. These assessments were made based on age and diminishing capacity over time. That's how we made this decision about rehabilitation. We want to have money in your budget in case we're right, okay? And then if we're wrong, you know, it, you've, got, you've got money in there to maybe drill a different well. And, and so there's a little bit of cushion in there for that. And, and your, your comment, uh, uh, rehabilitate the three wells and add three wells. Uh, based on uh, the population growth and all that, how far in advance, how far in the future would that? Uh... This whole discussion to this point is for the next five years for basically existing population plus the growth that's going to happen in that. So this is for basically your existing population. Just existing. Existing yeah. population. So we're only doing from now until five years out. There's no growth associated with this. This is just to shore up vulnerabilities that you have right now. Yeah, I'm still struggling with the uh, the concept that, you know, we're all intelligent people and we all like to uh, do a little bit of planning and uh, go to the doctor, like you say, and get our aspirins and things like that. We're 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 just in a uh, uh, a storm here, and uh, I I don't know how we've allowed ourselves to get into this position. And uh, I mean, I I've heard that you know you guys weren't the, the consultants on there. But everything seems to be pending. You know, you're, it takes this long to, to draw well, maybe, may take longer. May cost this much, may cost more. Uh, we don't know. So by not being able to present that information to us, I don't know if you can or can't, then you're, you're telling us that you guys are in a world of hurt, you got five years, and then you're going to be, we don't know. So well, I'm, I hope, I'm, I hope I'm, I'm not afraid. telling you that. I'm, I'm afraid when you say that. As a resident. Well, if you'll allow us to present all of the projects and kind of, un and kind of unfold it all, and you'll see how everything comes together, 
And again, just keep in mind that these are all projects to shore up your existing needs, really. And then the rest of our project, the rest of the master planning, after these guys do the hydraulic modeling of the whole system, we're going to get a better understanding of what you need for growth. But that's not what we're talking about now. We're just talking about the existing needs. So I need to move in the next five years. Well, if you do, I guarantee you the, the community that you're moving to is dealing with the same issues. Oh, not here in Arizona. Well, I just got back from San Luis Obispo, and they're dealing with the same thing, even though they're not growing anywhere near as, as much as you are. So. <laughs> this is a quick one. Can you do all three wells request at once? I mean, get the drillers in and... So the idea is to the, the idea is to deploy these in phases. And again, I'll show you. We kind of have these oh, things in groups. Okay. Yeah, in groups. So you'll see the groupings that we've got. And again, it's a matter of trying to be cost effective in, in hiring consultants and, and contractors to get things done, as well as managing what can be managed by the existing staff. I mean, if you tried to do all of these projects in the next 18 months, there's not enough people to do it, you know? within the staff to, to handle it. Um, just a quick question. I do understand, because I work for a city, there's always balance between raising rates to have that available cash to do all these rehabs, and, and we can leave that for a year longer. Unfortunately, decisions are made above that, that filter down, and I think that's where we're at now. And, and it's good that we're being honest about the fact that if we lost a well, we may lose pressure in the system, which gives urgency to, to what uh, Corolla is presenting. One quick question I did have is, if we already looked at potential sites and do we own the land or would that be additional costs that go it's into all it? part of what's in the cost okay. estimates. Okay, appreciate it. In some cases, we don't have a cost estimate for land and we've notated that. I'll show you that. Okay, thank you. So let's, oops. so again, everything that we're presenting here today, all five-year CIP projects, and again, CIP stands for Capital Improvement Program Projects, are for existing customers and not for future growth. This is the bad news. This is the full ticket. Um, and again, as I mentioned before, the water projects, um, the top line there, water supply, when you see that, that's what we're talking about, the wells. I'm going to go into detail on each one of these. So you'll see the breakdown and you'll see how this is all being deployed. Pumping is the pump stations, um, 1.7 million. Water storage, uh, I'll explain why we need uh, some work on your water storage. The CAP capital is the capital cost that you have to pay on the CAP water. It's a take or pay. If you don't pay it, you don't get your allocation, uh, regardless of what you do with it. Um, there are some needs, small, relatively small needs at the Bullard Treatment Campus that need to be addressed. Um, there are some problem areas with your water mains where the materials aren't the greatest. And again, that's relatively small compared to some of the other costs there. DMOM is a distribution uh, management and operation, operation and maintenance program. It's basically the best practice that a utility uses to make sure that the, the distribution system is operating and maintaining properly. So there's an investment there. And so the subtotal for water projects is almost $39 million. Uh, the wastewater projects are almost exclusively, exclusively based on condition. Uh, so, um, you know, each one of the, the water reclamation facilities has some pretty significant needs that need to be addressed really right away. Uh, some of the lift stations and force mains uh, have to have some improvements. And I'll explain what a lift station and force main is later. Um, the collection system is really what um, uh, Chair Committee Member uh, Sharp was talking about with the, the manholes. So I'll go into those a little bit. So the wastewater side is about $12.5 uh, There are some other projects that the city has carried forward, um, sort of projects that were in previous CIPs that were carrying forward, and those are at about $6 million. So the total for everything is about $57 million. And I'm going to go into the details now, if you'll allow me. Um, and again, I showed, we showed this map before. This just kind of gives you an idea of where your facilities are, sort of sprinkled throughout. And this is really focused on the water CIP. 
Um, that Cerival Gardens area is where, that's where the distribution system, uh, the pipelines need to be replaced basically. And um, I don't know what else we want to say about the sites. Is there anything in particular? And you said those are the sites where projects are located. So it's really all over the map. Okay, um, so with regard to the water supply projects, again, this is where we're talking about your wells. Um, the Adaman well has been drilled, but it needs to have treatment and it needs to be equipped. So the hole has been drilled, but everything else needs to happen associated with that in order for you to make use, use of it. And I'll show you the cost for that later. We do need to have a well siting study, as has been mentioned, to be able to basically deal with the drilling of new wells. So we've got new wells with treatment. We've got a, you know, first and second new uh, wells with, with treatment. Um, we've got to replace well number one, which is referenced in that old condition assessment. Uh, that's one of the wells that need to be replaced. Uh, we also, in this original table, said that well number three needed to be replaced. Uh, but and in this chart, we're saying rehabilitate. It's actually really a redrilling that needs to happen. So that's kind of a wrong word for it. It's actually a redrilling instead of a rehabilitate. We're, we don't have a plan for well number six because when we rehabilitate uh, 18A, B, and then well 19, we want to see what kind of capacity comes back as a result of rehabilitating. And if you don't have enough capacity at that point, when we get to that point, then you can say, well, maybe we need to replace well six at that period, at that time. So that's about the only cost savings that we can kind of squeeze out of this next five-year period uh, in water supply, we think. Okay. Um, pumping capacity uh, needs include site 12 and 13, the booster stations there. The one for 12 is really based on the need to provide water during peak hour demands, which is your June, July uh, time frame. Uh, site 13 uh, is vulnerable with regard to fire flow. If you had a significant fire in that area, the pump stations there are not sufficient to uh, be able to support it, again, according to the performance criteria. This is not something we're just making up. It's, again, the state statute with regard to performance criteria. And um, this is a pump station. This picture in the bottom is a pump station. You can see in that picture the vertical equipment there that's kind of standing up in the air, those are the, the pumps and the, the motors. And then you can see, like, uh, I'm just going to reference with my, with my mouse here. See these little blank spots right here? That's where the new pump stations would go. And this is which site? 12? 12. This is site 12. So basically, we'd be putting in new pumps there. And then um, in the condition assessment that we did, when we were looking at this, uh, these areas, we noticed that the pump stations themselves uh, have a significant amount of corrosion. Usually that's due to the soil conditions. And so before we start throwing pumps on those uh, blank spots, we want to make sure that there's integrity there uh, so you don't put a pump on something that's going to break in a few years. So first thing you want to do is do an evaluation, a more in-depth evaluation of those uh, pump stations to make sure they're in good shape. And if not, there might be a, a little bit of rehab that needs to be done, and we've got a cost estimate in there for that. Um, you need a new storage tank. This is one of your existing storage tanks, um, and you need another one about that same size, one and a half million gallons, uh, again, for just sort of meeting peak uh, day and, and as well as fire flow. And then the Site 13 reservoir does have some corrosion associated with it, so it needs a little bit of rehabilitation, and there's a, a cost, uh, you know, line item for that as well. Other sort of miscellaneous capital expenditures on the water side include, again, as I mentioned, the CAP subcontract capital charge. It's a take or pay. Uh, the Bullard Water Campus needs a little bit of rehab. Um, it's small relative to the other costs. Those water main replacements, and then I mentioned the the DMOM program that needs to have an investment put in it so that your, so that your operators can have uh, a better handle on things. Um, committee member Zednik mentioned, you know, why are we in this situation? Well, if we have a, a more robust DMOM program, you know, hopefully years down the road, we will have been doing preventive maintenance at a little bit regular, more regular rate, and um, you, won't be, you won't be seeing some of these sort of at failure uh, types of projects that need to be done. Chairman Sharp uh, wanted to talk about the manholes a little bit, um, the collection system. Basically, you need to understand that human waste has uh, a lot of sulfides in it. 
we, we excrete sulfide, it comes from our food, and the bacteria that grows inside a sewer system turns that sulfide into hydrogen sulfide gas. It's taking the sulfur and turning it into hydrogen sulfide gas. That basically becomes airborne and it eats concrete and steel. It basically dissolves concrete and steel. So where there's manholes, where either the coatings have been uh, maybe a pinhole, there was a pinhole in the coating, and you know, you've got a manhole on this, and if you don't need to go in there, you don't typically check it. When we pop the manholes occasionally, we find things like this, where uh, the concrete is basically eroded, the steel is falling apart. Basically what they need to do is get in there, sandblast all of that down, rebuild up with mortar the concrete, and then put a new coating on it to protect it so that it doesn't happen again. It's gonna happen over time, it always happens. We have to do this regularly, but those coatings tend to prevent that from happening. Lift stations are called lift stations because you typically want your sewage to be conveyed mostly by gravity. Well, every once in a while, the pipes get too deep, and you gotta lift it again. You gotta lift the sewage again, so it's basically a little pump station that lifts the sewage so that it can go by gravity again. Again, these are made out of concrete and steel. There's hydrogen sulfide gas. It breaks down the concrete and steel. They need to be repaired and replaced every once in a while. So that's what that's all about. The force main is the pipeline from that lift station that pumps that sewage to a new location for it to flow by gravity again. Those pumps aren't operating all the time. So that sewage is basically sitting in there baking, you know, just sitting there every once in a while, you know, for significant periods of time. And that's not good for the pipes. But again, uh, that's how we build these systems. They need to be repaired and replaced over time. The, the water reclamation facility improvements are varied. It's sort of, there's several facilities within the plant itself as you go through the process that are, that are degrading and need to be repaired. So there's sort of these overall improvements that need to happen at the water reclamation facility. And I would say all of these are sort of priority one. Uh, if you don't have, you know, it, it's just as bad to not have sewage treatment capacity as it, as it is to not have uh, water production capacity because if you don't have sewage capacity, you've got overflows into the, into the environment and also it's, you know, basically you're going to be telling everybody don't use your water system because we don't want any more sewage coming to us. So these are sort of critical items here. So this is a big chunk, $59 million or so. Uh, how do you implement that? Uh, in talking to staff, um, we wanted to look at kind of how can we manage this big, uh, this big ticket item. And so we've broken these down into group one, group two, and group three. We aren't calling them priorities because we think that they're all important, but really this group one list is probably some of the highest vulnerabilities that you've got. Even the well 19 block wall is there just because it's basically standing out there in the middle of a field without protection. So. That's a, that's a vulnerability issue. It's a small cost item relative to the others, but that's why it's in there. So you see the group one projects has two, or actually those, the, you got the CAP subcontract capital charge, you've got to pay that. The well, treat, the well and treatment facility, and then the next line item, the well and treatment facility, those are both part of the same project. One of them has to do with the equipping of the well and the treatment, and the other one has to do, well, the, the equipping and then the other one has to do with treatment as well as the, the conveyance pipeline to get the water into your system. So those are really one project, line items two and three. Uh, the groundwater siting study, again, is sort of a, a prerequisite before we do any new wells uh, after that. Uh, we have another new well. Again, its location is dependent on the site study. You need a brine line for site 12 um, for about 430,000. The site 12, Booster station improvements are there. The reservoir that I talked about that needed to be rehabilitated is there. The new reservoir, the 1.5 million gallon reservoir is there. And then again, that one, we don't have land included uh, yet. And how will we be identifying where that is? Is that dependent on the hydraulic model? Yes, it's the modeling phase, it's the final. Right, so we don't know where that's gonna be yet. It's gonna be dependent on what we find out from looking at your system uh, and identifying where there's capacity issues. Okay, so that totals 19 million, and what I'm gonna show you subsequent to this is just sort of a building on of that. Now what this does for you, the effect of these group one projects in satisfying the performance criteria for the 2015 demand condition is, 
it gets you somewhere on the storage with regard to the reservoirs. It helps you out with pressure and it, and it helps you maintain water quality. So we're checking the boxes on those things related to performance criteria. You're still a little bit vulnerable with regard to water supply, that is the wells. You're still a little bit vulnerable with regard to pumping and fire flow. So we're not quite there yet. And then so group two starts to address those. So if you go to the group two, slide 28. Now we're talking about the well 19 production improvement. This is the rehabilitation of well 19. We've got another new well in treatment. And you can see the price tag on that is $6 million. That's because we anticipate that it's going to need treatment, probably arsenic, maybe other things. So a well, a typical well at about you know, one and a half to two MGD is gonna be about one and a half to two million gallons plus equipping, plus the treatment technology, plus whatever equi uh, pipelines we need to get it into the distribution system. So that's why that price tag is so high. Uh, and then on this one, we also have well three, the well drilling of, of well three. Uh, and again, as I mentioned, we're not dealing with well six because we wanna see what kind of capacity we get out of all of these projects before we decide to do something with well six. Um, and at this point, we've done a little bit more with regard to your pumping and your fire flow, but we're still a little bit vulnerable on the water supply. The reason the words transmission pipes are, are in black is because we don't know yet what you're going to need there until uh, our project team does the hydraulic modeling as part of the rest of the project. So group three is kind of rounding out the remaining projects. I mentioned the uh, improvements that are needed at the Bullard Water Campus, basically filter assembly, rehab and replacement, uh, some piping improvements on that site as well. There is some, there is some uh, deterioration of the piping that's there. This is where we'll be replacing well one. Again, you can see the price tag there, same price tag as on the previous grouping. Uh, we'll be rehabilitating well 18B, and again, there's just a, a kind of a round number in there for what we might need to do there. We'll learn more after an assessment is done on it. The main replacements in the Cerebral Estates area is close to $3 million. That's just a, a bad pipe material thing that the pipes are out of warranty. There's no going back to the contractor. You, you, they just need to be replaced um, or there's gonna be some problems with main breakages there. Again, small, relatively small investment for the DMOM program that'll help with preventive maintenance over time. The well 18A rehabilitation is in there. And then those pump station blank, uh, where, where we wanna put new pumps, like I showed on that one slide that had the picture of the pump station with the blank spots for the pumps. We need to make sure that we evaluate the, the corrosion that's there to see if there's any integrity issues before we invest in any pumps. So that brings us to the $39 million on the water system improvements. And finally, we're getting close to uh, lessening the vulnerability on all of these issues. At this point, we want to look at where we're at with the water supply wells. Uh, again, being optimistic that the rehabilitation is going to get you to where the capacity needs are that you, you need, as well as the new wells. You might be fine, or at this point, we might be looking at drilling one more well. So just in summary, again, I'm not gonna go into too much detail on the wastewater projects. I, I sort of talked about what those are. Um, those are outside of the group one, two, and three. They're, I would say that because of that, they're really kind of group one with the group one projects, uh, critical infrastructure. And with that, we'll take questions. Um, I, I see that we have, we're, we're predicting that we're going to need three new wells, correct? Mm -hmm. that, that six million mm -hmm. shot, maybe four. We're just not sure yet. Um, and uh, because we, we did a... Um, an inadequate job on preventative maintenance that ran us into some of the situations that we're currently looking at today, correct? It's hard to say that, but I mean, you... I don't know how else you we're, say we're, it. we're at the point where some of these things need to be fixed, <clears throat> correct. You but, know, typ typ typically, excuse me, uh, typically in, in, 
in kind of the world where I came from, if, if you don't do preventative maintenance and you don't have a redundancy program, people are fired because it just puts you at so much risk and the, the mitigation is, is just so costly back to the residents. I'm, I'm just, I mean, I'm still beside myself on this whole situation that here we are looking at something that's only going to take us five years out. And we're looking at uh, $39 million. And, and we're not sure that even that's going to work. What, what other plans are, 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 is there more to this? Or, I mean, we're at a breaking point right now. Or, or are you going well, to continue on and say, no, you know, this is a, you, you know what, guys, I'm going to, uh, I, I've got, I don't have the silver bullet, but I can, I can help you out here a little bit. Uh, we're going to go buy Liberty uh, water system mm -hmm. for less than the $39 million. We're going to have the water that we need. I, I, it, we don't, you, you're not even I mean, close I, to getting there in terms of capacity and you well, still, um, and I want to say that th just keep in mind that for some of these wells, they're just at the end of their useful life. There's no, there's no rehabbing at, at some point. They do need to be replaced. They're over 50 years old, and they just don't last longer than that. But I don't buy that. What's that? I don't buy that. Oh, you don't? I, I don't. I believe that if you do proper preventative maintenance, things should last more than 50 years. Look around the, the rest of the world here. There's a lot of stuff that's out there that's more than 50 years old that are flying up in the uh, atmosphere right now. So the point being that, yeah, you can tell me that, um, that, it, that it's useful life is over. Uh, I don't necessarily agree with that personally. I, I think, again, good preventative maintenance could have uh, th thwarted off some of that um, and, and perhaps extended that further. I, I'm I'm just I am you you scare me to death, sir. Sorry to be the bearer of well, the no. truth. <laughs> other other questions from the committee members. Yeah, I've got a couple. Uh, just a little comment too. I understand the committee members. I mean, it's frightening. Uh, I kind of feel at this point it's kind of woulda, coulda, shoulda. Some of the wells are 60, 70 years old. Capacity could have been fixed a long time ago, possibly. We went through a massive recession where our budgets were cut and O&M budgets were slashed and killed, and, and I understand that. Um, my question to you is on some of the some of the specifics you mentioned on the you're, you're talking about treatment. Are we primarily talking about arsenic treatment or nitrate treatment, or is it mostly arsenic? Well, we we typically are pricing this based on the arsenic treatment technology. Um, we might run into other things like fluoride and nitrate, and even salinity might be a problem as well. Okay. If, if the salinity is too high, we might have to address that with RO. Okay. Uh, and then you did mention one of the things in here. You keep talking about the DMOM program. Is that a software package that basically becomes a new, or is it just a, could you explain just briefly what it is? I mean, it's $100,000, which is relatively cheap for a large scale overhaul of a maintenance program. It's a development of best practices for the water utility. So it looks at maintenance, it looks at operations. It looks at capacity and it lays out a program that the operators would follow on an ongoing basis to make sure that they're looking at and shaking everything and making sure that you avoid problems in the future as, as long as as long as there's funding for the ongoing effort for the operators to to maintain the system. Okay, it, so it, they get kind of a, a, a guideline and a program that they can kind of follow through and they get integrated into their daily and monthly routines and things. That's it, correct. It moves you away from a reactive mode to more, a more proactive way, way of doing things. Thank you. Um, I have a question about Site 13. Um, you've talked about it being a fire problem, and then you have um, said that you're going to rehab the storage tank up there, and that there's pumping um, costs, but don't we need a new storage facility up there? Because just rehabbing the one is not going to take care of the fire problem if it already exists and the water is already there. The, the biggest issue with the fire is the pumping capacity, not so much the storage. The storage oh. is necessary just for generally meeting peak hour and peak, uh, you know, peak day demands in, in that area, right? 
Yeah. So, so the, the one reservoir that needs to be rehabilitated, it's a structural integrity thing. You don't want the side of one of those reservoirs blowing open and all of that water being lost. Uh, so that's what we're doing on that one. The need for the reservoir capacity is again related to peak, <coughs> and peak day and hour demands for the, for the entire service area. A pump station itself is really kind of undersized, if you will, to meet a fire flow condition in that area. So that's why the pumps have to be added. New pumps have to be added to that pump. Okay, but <clears throat> say we had a fire, it would reduce the capacity of that particular storage area. And so and so you would end up with water shortages in that area unless you had more storage area. My understanding that of the analysis that we've done so far is the, the storage at well at site 13 is sufficient for the fire flow, it's just that the pumps are not. The pumps cannot move that water from the reservoir fast enough out into the distribution system. Is that correct? Right, and, and in, during a fire flow event, you are gonna draw down storage mm -hmm. from that reservoir since that's where the pumps are pumping water out of, but once the fire is put out, then there's time for the water level in the storage tank to go back up. And it would still meet the peak hours. Yes. The worst, the worst condition, we're planning for the worst condition, which is the fire flow condition. There's a lot of homes up there. <laughs> so, um. and, and it's not all of that area that's at risk. It's just, there's two different zones, and it's just the smaller of the two is the one that's at risk. Oh, okay. And then I have an, another question. <clears throat> this goes back to a couple of other meetings. We currently are not at f utilizing our full capacity of CAP water. And I believe it was said that we aren't using our full capacity because we could not treat it. Right? You don't have a you don't have a surface water treatment plant right now. Right. So in order to get more water um, because as we know the CAP water is going to be diminished I mean every day I, I pick up in the I've got news articles here about the Indians getting more water and and Nevada wanting more water they're going to put in some kind of a new system that's going to draw down Lake Mead and um, California and I guess I guess what I'm thinking about is these wells tap the aquifer, right? Doesn't increase any new water supplies from the CAP. Um, so I'm, I guess I'm wondering, isn't there something upstream that is treating CAP water that we couldn't draw on? You could access the white tanks uh, water treatment plant that's operated by EPCOR. Mm -hmm. Is that what you're thinking of? Yeah. The, just so you know, the projections of shortage on the CAP to municipal and industrial customers are way out in the future. The first hits are going to be to ag, not to the municipalities. But we aren't even utilizing our full allotment now, and if we don't utilize our full allotment, it could be taken away from us. No, it cannot no, be taken away from us. As long as you keep paying that capital charge, you will you will keep it. Okay. I'm wondering if we couldn't draw out some of this infrastructure expense by increasing our CAP just a little bit, that we couldn't move the the capital expenses down some, draw them out instead of five years, maybe a little bit longer. Right, to kind of balance what we could utilize with working on the infrastructure at a slower rate. The, the other, the, here, just so you understand this, so the way that your system is built is sort of reliant on wells. You've got, you've got wells all over the system with little spider pipelines that kind of go out from those wells to kind of serve the whole area. 
if you go to the CAP treatment plant, the, the White Tanks plant, you've got to pay for an increase in the capacity of that plant. They're going to make you pay for that. And then you've got to pay for a transmission line to get it into the city, which I think is like how many miles? 15, 15 miles, which is not going to be cheap. And then you've got to make sure that from where you bring it into the, the city's distribution system, there's transmission capacity to move it because the system was not designed for a single point of water like that, a big, huge single point of water. It was, it was designed based on being fed by these individual wells. I know that's, for somebody who doesn't do this all the time, that's hard to understand, but the pipes aren't big enough to transmit all of that water. You actually have to put in new transmission lines to spread that water across the city service area. So it's, it's not going to be cheaper to go to the surface water treatment plant at this point for the next five-year period. What's the water that comes down the canals? Is that strictly for agriculture and it's not treated then? It is not treated. It's raw water from either, well, the canals, I'm not sure which you're talking about, but they're either filled with Colorado River water that's been right. transported in or the Salt and Verde River water that's been tra transported in from SOP. But I'm not sure exactly where you're talking about. But. Well, we've got them. All over, we cross them right. every day when we go. Some of those are Hands blended up. with groundwater that the farmers are allowed to pump, the ag districts are allowed to pump into the canals as, as to blend with their surface water supplies. Just depends on which canal it is. Thank you. I just want you to know I'm also on the CAP board. I'm an elected board member of the CAP, so. I'm pretty well aware of what your vulnerabilities are associated with the CAP and their decision to do that, or municipal. Just, uh, just kind of off the cuff question. Um, I, I realized that uh, you know we're we're looking at spending thirty nine million dollars plus you know to uh, to get us to do the next five years. Yet, two of the uh, three reclamation centers, the water goes because of some developer agreements that goes primarily to them. So we're giving that water away. And we were out there planting all kinds of nice trees in that for spring training. And the Cleveland Indians aren't that good of a team. They don't deserve <laughs> all that. But, but irregardless, um, we planted a lot of uh, shrubs and trees and things like that that require water, not desert landscape. So, our, our, uh, again, I'm, I'm struggling with uh, a little common sense here. You're, you're asking, uh, or not, you're not asking, but uh, you're proposing that uh, we possibly are going to be spending $39 million, yet, in fact, we're, we're letting water slip between our fingers and don't seem to be addressing those issues. Again, I know that uh, some of those are agreements that were made you know, back in uh, VJ day. But irregardless of that, we got water problems. <laughs> and if we're just going to sit here and say, give me $39 million and I'll get you by another five years, and we're not addressing what we see today. And I think um, it's entirely appropriate for you as a water citizen's water planning committee to make recommendations on philosophy and policy for how we move forward in the city on how water gets basically deployed, how it gets conserved, you know, that type of thing moving forward so that there's sort of policy guidance as you move forward and development agreements in the future don't get you in that same bind. I mean, I think that's entirely within your realm. Right on. Well, one, one of you said the question was about coming down with legislation. I don't know if you were all a dialogue and talking about what you wanted to do. Sure. Um, I'm just struggling a little bit with the numbers. <clears throat> excuse me, um, on the gallons per minute. The, uh, the three wells that need to be replaced and the ones that have to be re re hit, uh, re <laughs> refurbished, I guess. Um, you're talking approximately 2,900 gallons per minute. Um, and then you stated that the, uh, the replacements, three new wells and the three replacements uh, uh, should be pumping about 1,200 gallons a minute. So you're going from 2,900 gallons a minute, pushing it to 7,200 gallons per minute. 
have we got the capacity to uh, store that or, or, or manage that, or is that built into this cost, these, or is there going to be something additional to this? These wells right here, the, these wells right here probably are not going to be restored back. I mean, they probably never even came close to 1,200 gallons per minute, uh, just because of where they're located in the, you know, the aquifer. But we do think that we'll be able to restore them to something better than what they're at right now. Typically, that's what happens. Um, so I don't think we're talking about going all the way up to 7,200 gallons per minute. Is that what we're expecting? Well, you're going to add production capacity between the rehabilitated wells and the new ones, so you'll have the capability of pumping more. You only turn on the wells that you need for the time, so they're not, those wells are not going to be used as much, obviously, in the wintertime. They're there for you in the summertime and during your peak demand conditions. And so the capacity from the well out into the distribution system includes the storage and the pumping and so on that we also have the recommendations for. For example, the pumping capacity at site 12 is based on the assumption that we're able to get at least one more well near that site. So you can take that water and pump it to your storage tank there and then have that capability to pump it out into the distribution system. So we, we have accounted for. Yes, well, and, and keep in mind, we're developing a plan and a deployment process with these three groups. And at some point, you're evaluating and saying, how are we doing? You know, you go, how are we doing on the rehab? And how much water are we actually getting out of these new wells? Do we actually need a fifth and sixth well within this five-year period? So that sort of evaluation has to happen as we go along. I mean, if we're getting a whole bunch of production out of them, maybe we're going to be safe, and you save a little bit of money, and then just wait till growth comes and let the growth pay for itself. I have one question. I don't – I'm asking about the details yet. But all of us on the committee, and you as well, go out and buy things or you buy services. And always there's an evaluation because you could spend more in the service or less in the service. How am I to be persuaded without too much detail that the numbers presented on page 19 are good numbers? These are planning level numbers um, that we use basically recent bid tabulations from contractors as well as sort of uh, standard materials lists for helping to develop the cost estimates for these projects. So because this is all we do as a firm, we have that recent information about what the going rates are for these types of projects. So they're fairly good planning level estimates. Is the industry, in economic terms or rather, uh, competitive so that the costs are very similar? Say that again. Uh, the more competitive an industry is, the more prices become uniform. Is the hydrology industry at such a point that the prices are somewhat uniform from, say, one service provider or one contractor to another so that you're allowed to do this, as well as materials? There or is there is, wide variance? I in would those say, numbers? from a drilling, a driller standpoint, they can pretty much pick whatever they want to charge you right now because it's such and a that such not, high demand. Okay, so the number might not be correct. I think we've been fairly conservative in this, recognizing the current conditions in the industry. Do you mm -hmm. want to say something? Well, now you're really yeah, going to scare I, Bill. I think here's. <laughs> Here's That's your humor. That, I'm just giving you humor. Yeah, now Bill's really severe. <laughs> Michigan's really beckoning now. <laughs> now I, these are conservative numbers. These aren't median level numbers. That's, I'm just, uh, please. They are conservative, and, and you pointed out one area where costs can vary, and that is the uniformity between different providers. But there's another area that I think you are at much greater risk of cost variability. And that is, I mean, first of all, planning level costs are different and it's not physically possible for them to be as precise as if you had proceeded and completed a design of any of this infrastructure. You would be able to 
predict the cost with much greater certainty. One of the big risks on costs you have is your treatment for the well water. At this point in time, we don't know what the well capacity is or the wells that have yet to be drilled, and there's no way we can know. We also don't know the well water quality, so we don't know. Typically, when you do treatment for well water, you treat to meet within a standard, and you don't treat the entire stream of water if, if you don't have to. And, but we can't tell you if you're going to have to treat 20% of the stream, 50%, or, or 75 or all of it, because we don't know the water well quality. And so, in my opinion, I think there is significant risk that the cost could vary because of the well water quality, and that's something that's just not knowable at this point in time. My question was different. I know we're at the planning stage. I know we don't know the precise number. What my question is, which was partially answered by Guy, I got the first answer, well, we know what the going rates are right now. But what I would like to see, and I th personally, and I th is, as you say, there's a variance. Are we at the median point? And how far could these stretch? Could they stretch? $57 million is the median, or the mean, or whatever moment you want to take at the distribution, the cost distribution. What are the end points? And what are the first moments from that? Could this stretch to 76 million? And could it go down to 19 million? And what's the probability that it would be, say, between 52 million and 66 million? That's more the question that I was asking. Okay. Does that make sense, my question? Yeah. Okay. When the, when the report here gets published, there's a table in here that ex explains that. These costs are classified based on the the Association for the Advancement of Cost Engineers, and they have a ranking so that people can look at it and know about what the costing accuracy is. They have classes from one through five. We're saying these are about a class four estimate for each of them. On the low side, it could be 15 to 30 percent low. On the high side, it could be 20 to 50 percent high. Thank you. You are answering my question. I didn't want to get into the details, but that's a detail that I think is important. So thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, the scary part of this is it's just for the current, but it's not for any growth at all. Correct. This gets you to so, so get you up to par. This five-year plan, though, group one, how many years is that year one and two? Then group two is three, or, or how is this broken down? It's, it's, it's sort of more of a deployment scheme, um, and, and it, it would be great if you could do all of them right away, but just from a staff resources standpoint and, and actually executing this with the money that you'll be bringing in, assuming a rate case goes through, there's a time frame over that five years that it needs to happen. This is sort of what we're recommending in terms of groups of projects. Um, I guess it could kind of be looked at by year, but we are looking at it more in terms of the reasonableness of trying to get these things done together because over the five years. You know, group one and group two, the water supply isn't affected by how much are we spending, you know, uh, $27 million. And the water supply remains the same. It's still low. Not until you hit the group three projects do you see even that you have to reevaluate. You are getting you are getting additional water supply. It's just that you're you still have some vulnerabilities associated with it. And one more, how much land does a storage reservoir require? Uh, usually they're on two or three acres. Okay. Right? Storage reservoir, 1.5 MG. Yeah. So is there a criteria, though, um, something that ADAC has set forward as a state that it has to be, you know, level, no grade, or anything like that? Is that general? Specific land, or can it be, you know, 
No. It, it, it's land that in the study that we would do, we will look to identify some possible locations that would be beneficial from the perspective of the water distribution system. And then the city will have to go out and see if they can find some land to buy somewhere in those areas that appear favorable for the water distribution system. And then a design engineer, when they design a site, they will lay out and, and let you know also how much space you need, not only for the tank, but to be able to move equipment in and out and put in a pump station and so on. And then the city also has their own guidelines for how they're to be designed and built. Most of your reservoirs are sunk down in a, in a lower area so there isn't a high profile that is obvious for people driving around and so. But that you wouldn't want to put two storage facilities next to each other. Uh, sometimes. The distribution, the way it, could you put two storage reservoirs next to each other? You, you can and sometimes that is done. That can be advantageous for maintenance if you have to take one tank down and you still have another one mm -hmm. to operate with. So you'll see them both with more than one tank in one side or, or just single tanks. I do. Um, and you might have went over this. I missed it. I apologize if I did. But how many millions of gallons a day do we feel like we're Need, in need of to, to meet the fire demand, the customer demand, the peak demand? 5.7 MGD. 5.7 MGD short is what? Okay. And being that roughly 700 GPM is going to give you about a million a day, then the rehabs of the three wells, 18A, B, and 19, would give us 2.2 of that. Is that correct? If everything works no, out in the perfect we world, don't know. right? We don't know yet. Right. Okay. And uh, so we still need to make up another 3.4 mil somewhere. We need to come up with another 3.4, which means more wells. That's what that bottom right. line is. Yeah. The uh, what I'm wondering is, and just to put it in perspective for myself and everybody else, the 57 mil, 58 mil that we're looking at right here. If we go in, if we went into a contract with Global and had them treat part of the water, put in a new pipeline and get it over here, get it into the distribution system, the usable CAP water, do we have a rough estimate of what that would be? And versus the cost of a, a new treatment, surface treatment plant for us, for instance, to treat CIP on our own. Because my feeling is that the 58 million, although it's a, it is a scary number, it's bad that we made it to that place. But what is that in comparison to the global connection, which we wouldn't own? Global can turn around and sell it to whoever's going to pay the most, you know, for treatment out of that plant. And then what's the cost of a new treatment plant? So in other words, the viable options that we have, how do they compare against $58 million? The, the city has an infrastructure improvement plan where they have some budget numbers for the pipeline and for the treatment. I can't remember exactly what those costs are, but I'm going to say treatment plus a pipeline and so on is roughly on the order of 48 million or so. You'd have to check the, that document to see, but the whale costs are 27 million of that 58. And so you could not get the, the CAP water here and delivered for the price that you could get the wells that's, in here. That's what I was trying to allude to. And then the cost of a new surface water treatment plant can be $100 million, $150 million, depending on capacity needs, right? Yeah, there's, the, the city has a cost, and I don't remember the, the exact amount, but there's a cost per, per MGD or per, per thousand. Per six, I think $6.6 .6 million of treatment capacity that can be added in increments to that uh, global water treatment plan. And so, of course, sorry. So that's been established. $29 million for to get 6.6 .6 million potable water out of CAP. 
Does not include? Does not include, does not include and also the transmission keep in pipeline. Mind that that treatment plant is taken down periodically for maintenance and because the canal out, so you still have to have well capacity for Staffing when Staffing demands, tools, vehicles, gotcha. I was just trying to put into perspective what our options are, how much they would end up costing if we went a totally different route versus this. And it sounds like even though it's 58, it's because we're gonna own it, because we're gonna own the other three wells, we need to get in in the ground, obviously, to make up that 3.4 million that we're short. To me, it seems like the best, and this is just a, an opinion, it seems like a good option as far as the money goes. And it's it's horrible because I work in this industry and I know one of the pumps that you guys showed up there will cost $40,000. So it adds up quick, I get that. But I just wanna make sure we're looking at all of our viable options and which one are we really gonna spend the next $50 million of the citizens money on. The other component of that is that in addition to the CAP capital, you have to pay the O&M costs associated with that water for when you put it to use. So there is a cost of putting it to use above and beyond what you're already paying. Thank you very much for your time. Chairman Columbia, did you have some questions? Sure do. Okay. All right, so let's let's go back to, I believe uh, Committee Member Zenick asked this question about, uh, we talked about five years. And I was always assuming that we understood what the population was gonna be five years from now. But then I heard you say, no, that's current right now. But yeah, we're looking out five years. I thought I saw a slide somewhere in time talking about a growth from, I think, 68,000 to 79 or 76,000. I thought that was the growth. So that's going to be my first question. Maybe you're not the right folks to answer that one. You and keep the, and the question is, is there so a the question is, is the, is the five years, is that covering the population growth? That is not. That's what I heard. So that's, that's what I heard him that's say. That's what I'm hearing. So no. So, okay. So, so. As far as the people, we're talking population now. As far as the product, we're talking water and capital equipment. So we don't have, we really don't understand the people. We understand the product. We don't, we understand the process, that's us. We understand the pricing, but then as committee member uh, Minerick mentioned, and you were having a dialogue that that price can change. So. What I see is we have some issues. We have some pretty big issues. Uh, one we're talking about, again, about five years. Where's the preventative part of that? If we're only looking out five years, how about the next five years? When's that gonna happen? Is that gonna happen after we've went 10 years out? Uh, again, pricing, that's got me worried. I think, uh, remember, uh, Minerick is correct. Uh, we're looking at 59 million. I think it's gonna go much higher. Is the supply and demand is going to play into this? If everyone's fighting for water, everyone's fighting also for those companies to drill the wells and that sort of thing, who then are going to increase their pricing? So supply and demand is playing here. Uh, so I don't see that $59 million. I think that's just an estimate. I think it's a low-end estimate. So uh, I, I guess uh, I'm just rattling on, but I, I, see a, I see a problem coming. Okay. Other questions? Any questions, though, before we go to the comments? Because I do want to get us to the having this dialogue like you're starting, Chairman. That's, yeah. Oh, we'll go to, right. no, no, I don't, uh, that's it. I was just rattling on. Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, please, committee member Scheid and then committee member Sharp. One of the other questions I had is, I know this is an integrated master plan that you worked on and we've heard primarily about water. Uh, we didn't talk as much about the wastewater. Is any of the reclaim side or any of the other parts of this, is that, was that not considered a priority enough to be integrated into the next four to five years as far as that part of the, the process? Yeah. When we looked at, we did look at whether or not there were reclaimed water needs that needed to be addressed in this five year time period. And there are already plans that the city has underway to, to address reclaimed water issues that we did not need to add that to this list of projects. So it, it hasn't been forgotten. And when we do the integrated master plan, which will happen now through the end of the year, that's when we'll look at the future growth and we will look at water, wastewater, and reclaimed water needs as a part of that. Did everyone hear that? Because I know we had several questions about the future, so I just want to make sure everybody heard that comment. Okay, uh, committee member Sharp. 
I had a question uh, under the group two projects where you said it needs hydraulic modeling. And part of my question, I guess, would go to committee member Merritt's um, question about real costs. So hydraulic modeling should give you a very realistic rather than a, um, rather than a shotgun approach to costs uh, based on what it costs now, which we know probably isn't going to happen. <laughs> but um, so I guess my, my feeling about it is, is that why would we want to spend money until we know what the hydraulic modeling is? We don't need hydraulic modeling for these projects right now. We do need hydraulic modeling to know where that one reservoir is going to go, but you still need to plan for the cost of it. By the time we get done with the hydraulic modeling, it'll be well within the next five years. I mean, we're going to finish that within probably eight months after we get done with this part of the project. But don't you do that before you well, get into the five years? Don't you, don't you, like, okay, explain to me hydraulic modeling, what, what that covers. Go ahead. Yeah, hydraulic model is a, a computer representation of all the pipes, pumps, storage in your water distribution system for, for a water system hydraulic model. And, and there are hydraulic models for collection systems and, and reclaim systems as well. That model allows you to simulate daily operation of the water system and you, you try a variety of test scenarios under a maximum day condition or a peak hour condition you run the model and see if you have sufficient pressures and if you have sufficient flows to be able to serve your water system. So then the outcome of that mm -hmm. is usually going to be what pipes and what transmission mains you need to add to the water system. Once you have that list of infrastructure, then you go through the costing procedures similar to what we've done for these projects and figure out a cost for those pipes to be added. So then you've done the hydraulic modeling. No, we haven't yet. I think committee member Sharp, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I think that she's wondering, is there something else that's going to follow on? There's going to be additional something that's going to come out of that that we don't know yet. Well, I, I heard, for instance, that we don't know until we drill the well what we're going to be treating. That's what I heard. Does hydraulic modeling tell you that doesn't? No, it's just no. distribution. So there's two things that need to be done. The, the hydraulic model will be done kind of after this, and it'll help us identify where that reservoir needs to go, basically, more than anything. The groundwater study that has to be done is a well siting study that tells us where we're going to be allowed to put in wells. But until we drill a test well, basically a, a small test well, and draw up water from that site, we will not know what exactly is going to be needing to be done as far as treatment for that well. You have to drill a test well first to get the water quality to be able to know what to do with it. So that's separate from the hydraulic modeling. Okay. So hydraulic modeling is basically distribution system pressures and Correct. those kinds of things. Correct. OK, so then why? So you've already done it for plan for group two projects? No. You have not. No. So I guess my, my feeling is, OK, I can maybe see group one projects going forward. But until we have that hydraulic modeling to nail down the costs, why would we want to go any further? Uh, group two, um, you do need a well 19 uh, rehab, independent of what the distribution system is doing. You do need another new well. Uh, the site 13 zone um, zone two is the is the pump station that is necessary for improvements related to fire flow, and that's just based on calculations from the performance standard. And then well number three is one of the wells that we've identified that basically needs to be re-drilled and and um, re-equipped. 
So none of those have anything to do with the actual distribution system. They are all related to pumping capacity and new water supply. Okay, Which is not part of hydraulic modeling. It's just meeting the demands that you have and it really related to peak and fire flow. Did you want to say something well, else? I was just going to say, I, I think what might be causing confusion is you mentioned on the group two slide that uh, transmission wasn't evaluated, but it's also uh, on group one projects. Oh, I see. Is that what you're focusing it's on? Sort of the committee chart? Mm -hmm. We're doing this a little bit out of order. Yes. Okay. So the reason that transmission pipes have not been evaluated yet, um, and, and we may identify some capacity needs that need to be improved as a result of doing the hydraulic modeling, but the, the likelihood of them having the same cost implications of any of this is fairly low. And they are not as big of a deal in terms of vulnerability that, than these, that, as these are. So for example, we might find we might find a limitation in a 12-inch pipe that really would be better if it was a 16-inch pipe, but you probably wouldn't do that project for several years out uh, when you're doing additional improvements to, do, to, to, to rip open the street and, and make that change. It's not as critical as some of these vulnerabilities that you're dealing with right now. We okay? Committee Member Sharp, we got okay? Mm -hmm. All right. Um, committee Member Zenit, you had your hand open. Yeah, just a quick uh, follow-up uh, with Committee Member Scheid. He, he indicated, or you guys indicated, that none of this has anything to do with uh, the Ukraine water. It's, it's kind of a separate issue. If we were to include the uh, reclaimed water, uh, what would that do to the $15.9 million? Does that increase it, decrease it, uh, allow for a longer period of time? Why aren't we considering all aspects of this? Well, most of the recycled water is, if I understand correctly, is either being recharged or it's going to a couple of developments through development agreements. Right. And, and you already have projects in place to deal with the recharge. You've got the, the soil aquifer treatment site that is recharging the reclaimed water now. That's going to be replaced with some Beto zone wells in a project that the city has out right now. Uh, so you're pretty much already dealing with your available recycled water for the next five-year period. That's covered. So the, uh, the, the opportunity to um, uh, utilize some of that reclaimed water then uh, uh, has evaporated. No, you're, you're banking every drop of water underground. The water that does not go to the developers through the development agreements, all the rest of that is becoming part of your groundwater supply. All of the rest of it is becoming part of your water supply that goes through your assured water supply designation. Why aren't we considering using it? You are using it. I mean, uh, the uh, water from the developers. Um, those are through however many something dozens of agreements that. And I are think in we place. have. Well, have we responded to that question before? On, I sounds familiar with the reclaim water. Okay, I thought so. Okay, so yeah, we. I, I saw the answer. Okay. I didn't agree with it. I okay. You're entitled. <laughs> You're certainly entitled. <laughs> uh, may I move on to our comment period? Is it we good? All right. I'm gonna. Can you click me through to just there's some questions right at the end, guy? Thank you. All right. So here's where we want to have some dialogue because because you started talking about some of your thoughts and um, opinions even. So what are your comments when it comes to the various critical needs that you heard presented? What what's what's on your mind? Maybe we haven't heard it, or you want to expound upon it. Or you have to think we missed something. I'm going to start right here, I guess. Committee Member Scheid. I think probably one of the only comments I have written down, too, for us is Corolla's given out a, a, a phased approach and projects, and they're showing where the critical needs are and all. What I'd like to hear back from, not from Corolla, but from the actual city staff, if they're going through these, do they have projects that they've, that's been identified that they think are maybe high on the list of tier one? Should we move to this, you know, in this, if there's five things in phase one, but we think number four should be moved to one, what, what would their recommendation be for both the water and the wastewater side? Because coming from me, this is funny, Jason will laugh, but if we increase our capacity, we still need to maintain that wastewater facility. Those projects are gonna probably have to go 
close up because if we're going to be able to put more down the system, they're going to have to be able to handle the capacity uh, again. So you're still it's a it's a two phased approach and. And we saw some of the pictures. I think some of the wastewater sites have probably been ignored more than it should uh, for whatever reason. I think that's probably the biggest comment I have is just trying to, I'd like to hear back from the actual city staff what their priorities would be and, and based on the studies that they've seen from Corolla as they go through the project. I know you're not done. Did, and so did the, may I ask if I may, one moment, did, did the city uh, weigh in or, I mean, have, provide their information too as part of this? Yes. So is this representative of what you feel the priorities are as well? So I. <coughs> Does yeah, that help? Yep. Okay, I just want to make sure. Yeah, All right. Never mind. Okay. <laughs> Any other thoughts, comments? Um, committee member Sharp. Um, I guess I'm interested in hearing about how the rate structure is going to address these horrific costs and how it's going to affect the um, estimate. Because right now, I see horrific cost to the consumer. And so I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to minimize this and maybe take it over you know, an extended period of time. That's my concern. So you're anxious to see what happens at the next meeting when we talk about the rate study. OK. Um, committee member Zednick, thoughts? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I, a few of them. but. Um, you know, essentially, um, we we've heard we've heard a boatload of information from everybody, and to their credit, has been presented very well. Um, I'm, I was kind of looking for something a little more concise and something that more or less had a um, systemic flow to it. You know, like uh, here's a list of all the facts: We're getting water from here, we we, we need water there. Uh, list of all the facts that we know today um, and, and they're they're spread out in all these notes yeah so to try to put these all together you know uh, you, you need the big blue from IBM yeah. to do that for you right and three meetings and, and at least three meetings <laughs> uh, so so a list of the facts a list of what our requirements are mm -hmm. you know and we do have a good list of requirements though I, I do I do like uh, your list there with you know for fire uh, you know for That's, that's good. So I think our requirements are, are kind of defined, although we're only looking at five years, and it's this five years. <laughs> and like I said, sir, you scare me to death. Um, and then the, the other thing was uh, options. You know, what I haven't, we have a lot of options, um, but I don't know what all those options are. You know, are the, are the options um, uh, to, to spend $59 million and, and just go to do it? I think that as a citizen of Goodyear, that would drive me nuts. And I think it's going to drive everybody else nuts when, when they find out that they have <coughs> $59 million in the, in the red here. You know, um, so I think that what are our options? How can we mitigate some of this stuff? What, what are some of the, um, the ways that, that, uh, that, that we could to get water from? You know, Mark, Mark Holmes had mentioned, oh, well, maybe we buy more water and put it in as a savings account to the aqua. I like that idea. I think that's a great idea. Uh, but, but then again, are, is that one of our options? Is that something that we consider? Are we considering partnering with, um, with Buckeye or with Avondale? Uh, Avondale uses uh, all their water for, to recharge the aquifers only, don't they? They're reclaimed. Wow. <laughs> Sounds kind of mean to me. But, you know, I mean, what, what are our options out there? What are the costs that are associated with those options? What are the benefits? of those options. I mean, we've talked for months and, and we've hit on a million different targets, but we haven't put anything in a logical systemic flow that says problem, possible solution, and then option, and, and cost associated. So I, I'd like to just uh, go through a quick, just to make sure I understand the where you're going with that. because. What we tried to do and what the city staff tried to do was to try and um, evolve into the information you needed kind of in, in, a, in a, a, you know, specific approach so that you would start from this is what we have and this is how it kind of all works. And that's when Mark Holmes and Mark Siemens talked to you about the water resources and the wastewater. 
And then to the next point, we said, okay, and here's about how our rate study would take place, you know, when that comes, when that time comes, but this is just the methodology. And then they went into the integrated water master plan. And at the last meeting, were you at the last meeting? I forget. Someone, you missed it. So at the last meeting, um, the Corolla engineers went into this long um, presentation about the requirements and, and why, how they evaluated things and what assessment took place and what the requirements were and the criteria that they measured that against and, and how they kind of came to this next piece, which is what needs to be done. So I'm, we're hoping that evolution got, got you there. I, it, it didn't. It didn't. Well, it, I would it, encourage it, you to, to look at la, last one only because it, it does define all of the criteria. Well, Very and, helpful. and the requirements, uh, you know, that they discussed today I understand those, and, and that uh, that was good. I, I was kind of looking for like a big whiteboard. Here's the facts. Here's the requirements. Here's our options. Here's the costs associated with it, and I can look at it on a one pager and say, "This is what I got," and these are this is what we have. Instead of going through and looking at, well, we really don't know if we got to uh, dig another well. We really don't know if we have to put plastic. I mean, I understand that you don't know if you have to do that. I, I mean, I'm not criticizing you. I'm just saying, here we are. We still don't know anything. I, I, I don't mean it that but, way. And, and not to, but I really would encourage you to look back through that presentation last time because it, it seemed like it was very informative. We didn't get a whole bunch of questions, and it really talked to the criteria, and they did line it out. I, I'm a layman like you all are. So for me, it seemed like it made sense what they were measuring stuff against and then how we got here. In fact, the slides that you saw, here, the first few were their kind of recap from last time. Guy, did you want to? And if you need us to go over it with you, just oh, call us. Absolutely. We will. Okay. There you go. Thank you very much. Um, uh, committee member Passion. Um, maybe just a simple comment. When do we start? <laughs> when do we start, right? <laughs> uh, and, uh, Guy and Richard, you guys did a very good job. You presentations, and, and I understand it's just preliminary, right? It's not even a full detailed uh, evaluation that you've done. Um, sounds like we, we are not in dire straits yet, but, you know, we're just one maintenance issue away from dire straits. So I, I think it's, you know, it's pretty uh, pertinent to get started right away. Thank you. Committee Member Menard, comment? Well, Bill, I take exception a little bit. Um, from my vantage point, uh, things are somewhat coming together. Um, but perhaps that's because I see things the same way. Because when I offered my subcommittees, I proposed the balanced plan that Mr. Beckley put out. I said those should be the three subcommittees. So to me, I, I have now got a handle on the infrastructure. I do have a handle on the rates and the dollars and the costs. But when I asked, when I volunteered for this, um, Mr. Beckley said, what haven't we heard about? And what I, I feel we haven't heard about is sustainability. What happens if the Colorado River dries up? Uh, we, I really believe I have learned a lot about the infrastructure, and we could talk about that. I really think that we've learned an awful lot about the rates and the dollars, and in, in time, we can talk that out. But I don't think we have heard, learned, where is the water going to come from? We know there's an aquifer under there. We know there's a plume, and we're trying to keep care of it. We know that. We know there's a drought in California. We know lake meat's going down. But I don't think we've talked at all about sustainability, long-term sustainability, particularly if we have the growth pattern that Jerry envisioned with the future plan, whatever the 40 year plan, whatever they put out there. We haven't, I have no idea what that is. I asked months ago, that was the one point that I don't think we have heard about that we know about. In politics, they talk about the pipeline where they can shoot goo from northern Canada down to New Orleans. Well, Canada's loaded with water, and it's not goo. Can we do that? Santa Barbara finally is deciding that they're going to take their desalinization plan out of mouthballs. And San Diego's plant's going on, uh, going to come online uh, the fall of this year. But we haven't talked about buying San Diego water. We haven't talked about 
any of that. We haven't talked about building our own desalinization plant, perhaps, you know, and having Gulf of Mexico water be pumped in or, or doing a regional plan. So that's the part that I would ask my committee members, if you've heard about it, I haven't. And that's the big part, because I think I have the other two with a little bit more study. It's loose in my head right now. But the sustainability, what are we going to do 40 years from now when if our population is tripled, which we wanted to do? Isn't it? And Jerry, that was your plan, wasn't it? Wasn't that the city plan, Deba? It was 2025. Yeah. Okay, 10-year plan, yeah. That's it. Well, and I think that there isn't your next piece, the future kind of look at, at all, everything, water and wastewater so, for So keep in mind, Goodyear. you have a rate consultant under contract that needs to look at the rates for right now. We're telling you what you need to do to get up to par. Guy, so rates, right costs, I got all that. I've seen all that. And so the next part of our project, we're just, what are we in, 25% of our project for you guys? So the rest of the 75% of the work that we're supposed to do is addressing the future needs. And we're going to be looking at some of the vulnerabilities oh. associated with the supplies. So I am correct that I haven't heard anything about you that. You have not heard that yet. That's okay. true. We'll be talking about land use plans. We'll be talking about population projections. We'll be talking about where growth might be happening working with the community development people all Well, how that. soon are we going to hear about that? Because we're running out of time. I was just going to say, I don't think that. Yeah, oh. yeah I was going to say, okay. the, you're no, gonna... no, you're good. Yeah. I think you were going to the same place. What Guy's talking about is the entire project that they are working on. When he's talking about we, it's that project, which is the entire integrated water master plan. To meet the schedule that Teresa went over with you earlier so that you can develop recommendations we ask them to accelerate the first five years. Your comments on sustainability, for example, are very warranted comments that can be included within a report that, because I don't know that you'll get more information, Mark has some, but I think you, you're asking good questions. How are we going to deal with that? And if you don't feel as we go through this process you're getting that, I think that that also can be raised in the report that goes to the city council. Hopefully some of that will be addressed a little bit later when they come in, but that'll be passed when you've done the main focus. And of course, we encourage you to stay involved. Yeah, okay. Did that help? It does. Thank you. I also spoke because the chairman said we didn't have to stop at 8.30, so that's why I had the liberty to go on for three extra I can minutes. I go on a little further. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't mind, once again, I'm going to yield. All right. Committee Member Wilson, did you have any comments? Uh, or? Anything we missed? What I was thinking was probably we're getting real close to the time when we look at not what has to be done in the next five years, but how. So I'd like to start thinking in terms of higher up and then going down to detail. What should be the goal from five years from now, in addition to undoubtedly another review, another water planning committee, if not sooner? But also, you know, should our goal be to take care of the immediate problem, but also you know, things like uh, at this point we should have the water for the city of Goodyear plus the growth for anticipated plus 25% above that capacity or, or what that capacity would be. And then start looking at how we can accomplish that so that the next water planning committee isn't behind the eight ball as, some, as it kind of feels like we are a little bit here. Uh, but you know, from that standpoint, I've been around city politics, I kind of understand how we got a little bit, uh, just because, you know, from the different committees I've worked on, and I hear things, <laughs> but, uh, you know, the, the idea of, is to start looking at uh, putting up in place those different things that hopefully we don't, don't get back into this position, and I think, you know, this is a good, this is the best place to start that. Uh, also, I think at some point what I would like to see whiteboard <laughs> is, uh, and at some point with Mark and so forth, to kind of design is how this whole thing is going to build out in terms of water supply when we have it available through the CAP and all that. Just an idea of how that's going to flow. From my understanding, things have been said in the past. Even if you have CAP, that CAP water, I think, was going to be fed into the aquifer. But you still have to have all those wells. And so, you know, it's two different phases. You know, fit it into the 
aquifer is, is a higher level type thing. But then what we're dealing with, have been dealing with the last few meetings is getting it out of the aquifer and to the, to the public. Of committee members, Ednick? These wells are assets to the city, right? Yes, ma'am. So not only are we looking at rate structure, but we're also looking at perhaps because these costs are so overwhelming, bond sales? Oh, I think that'll be discussed next time as far as how this all comes out in terms of finances or making it happen. So it's not only building the rate, it's, you, there's other sources of funding for this gigantic. I'm going to wait with bated breath just like you are to see what happens next <laughs> <Please> month. <say> yes. <laughs> really, just this, we wanted you to see what kinds of numbers look like, and then they, we can figure out where they go or if they go. But any thoughts on the projects you heard or the, the need for them? Well, the, the only thought nature? that I had when I uh, looked at the tape again, because um, I did miss the meeting, uh, I think it was Mark Sweeney said that they physically looked at um, the wells. I think that's correct. Um, every five to seven years. Yes, I see a nod. That sounds right, Committee Member Zednik. Okay, is this management program you're talking about, this EMOM, and does that change maybe perhaps certain guidelines instead of five to seven years? Can we look at these wells every other year or every three years? Or yeah, it's basically a best management practice that's kind of based on industry standards. And so we will, in addition to the wells, we'll be looking at really the entire system on how how the system should be operated and maintained and managed. So it sets up a timeline, so to speak. I don't know how, how specific it'll get. It really depends on um, the particular infrastructure that you, you know, that you have. I don't, I mean, I don't know that we'll get that specific in terms of the number of years mm -hmm. that go by before you check things, right? But those, those could be the kinds of things that are included in that document. Yeah. Uh, Vice Chair Battern. Um, first off, thank you, everybody, for your work. I know by working in this industry how long it takes and how much time it takes, so appreciate you for that. Um, to be honest, I would like to build a little more cushion in. We talked about how many gallons were short, how many bare minimum wells we would need just to get to where we need to be within the next five years. Um, I agree, agree strongly with Peter. We need we need to look at building in some redundancy in working in this industry. There's nothing worse from an operational standpoint of wanting to serve a citizen than going, if one pump goes down, we're shot. We're going to be in the news. I'd like to see, and, and you guys may have that coming up, you know, with the different packages of things that were possible to be done, but it seems like what this presentation was is really bare minimum to get us there. And the longer we wait on it, as with big projects and municipalities go, the longer we wait to move on these things, the more expensive they get. That's been addressed by other committee members tonight. So I would, I'm curious to see a timeline uh, to when we're actually going to get close to where we need to be based off, you know, a rough <coughs> agreement, you know, moving forward. And... Generally speaking, they don't always, they're not going to go, okay, tomorrow we need $58 million, so we're going to split that up amongst the customers that we currently have. There are bonds. There's a lot of other ways that cities are able to, to finance these type of things that it takes longer to pay out, but it's like buying a new car. You don't, you know, you can go pay them all the money at once, but more than likely you make payments over it, and that's what they do is they'll break it up, and I think that will be reflected in the rate study, if I'm correct. Next month up. Oh, got the thumbs yeah, up. Oh, thumbs up. Okay. <laughs> just want to make sure. And that was all. That was all. I just, I really would like to see us get to a place that it's, we're not right on that ragged edge of this is the bare minimum of what we need. Thank you, Vice Chair. Chairman Columbia. First, I'd like to say to Corolla Engineering, I think you guys did a good job, um, especially under their pressure. Um, I think the committee members all asked some great questions. I do hear the concerns, uh, one being sustainability, preventative maintenance. Um, those are things that we'll bring up as part of the, our recommendations. Um, I, uh, I think that's about it for now. 
I'm going to save the rest for later. Later this meeting? <laughs> next meeting. Next meeting. Oh, next meeting. Okay, because I was going to say I can do another round robin if we need it. <laughs> Any other questions or comments related to the presentation? We've missed anything. All right, well, then I will. Oh, I did want to remind you about the May 19th. And so we have two meetings next month. That's the one thing I did want to do, May 12th and May 19th. And they're important meetings. It's going to be about the rate information. Okay. Also, did anybody want to revisit the um, recommendations? Where were they? Um, sorry, let me find them here. Um, that sheet given, yeah, the meeting guidelines. Anybody want to revisit this? No? Just wanted to. Want to go over it one more time? Oh, okay. Then I will yield the meeting back to the chairman. And one thing I wanted to throw out, it's very critical that everybody show up at the next two meetings in May. So uh, there's, there's going to be a lot coming out in those meetings. Okay. Well, now it's time for questions from the public. Can I ask, are there any comments, question cards? Okay. Well, how ironic. Here, we'll have one. Oh, there's, there's one me. back there. I didn't see the hand. Excuse me, try that, uh, say that name again. Royce. Royce, Royce. okay. It's on, it'll be on the website, through the city of Goodyear, tomorrow, usually by tomorrow, tomorrow. It'll be there tomorrow. For this presentation, it'll be there tomorrow. The minutes? Ten business days. Mm -hmm. Okay? All right, thanks. Well, ironically, now it's time for information items. Does any... Does anyone on the committee have information items they'd like to share? Anything other? Any others? I do have a question. Do you think you were accurately quoted in the newspaper? <laughs> I would say 95%. Okay. Thank you. Okay. The next meeting will be held on Tuesday, May 12th, 2015 at 6.30 p.m. There being no further business to discuss, this meeting is adjourned.